Hello and welcome to the teardown video on the Swiss Sonic HAD1 High Performance ADDA Converter. Let's start by taking a look at the outside of the device. On the front panel we can find the input selection buttons for the line, USB, SPDIF inputs. There is also a clipping indicator light to monitor the line input clipping. The headphone output is a standard 6.3mm or quarter inch connector. Ok, let's flip this thing over. On the back we have the optical SPDIF input, SPDIF output and USB input. And we can see that this device is actually also a digital to digital converter, since you can have it output a optical signal if you are using the USB input. The power supply is a 15 volt DC one and the connector is a standard barrel plug. On the back panel we have both the line outputs and inputs with the gain selector for the line input. Note that the line inputs don't have a positive gain, so if you want to use them with a microphone, you will need a separate microphone preamplifier. Of course connecting a mic straight to this device is also quite hard, since you need a wonky cable for it. I have taken off the front panel and the back panel of the device and now we can have a peek inside. First we can see that there are two PCBs inside. The top board is insulated from the case by something that looks like a tape. And that is because we don't want the through hole component legs to be shorted through the metal case. The bottom board is not insulated from the case. The through hole component legs are not that close to the case so it's all fine. Now let's take off the top part of the case. The other side is, is a bit stiff and we can see why in a second. The PCBs are connected by a standard 2.54mm or 0.1 inch header row. I like this design because it makes the assembly easier as there is no need to run wires inside the case. First thing we can see inside is that there are quite a lot of aluminum electrolytic capacitors scattered all over the board. This is what I would call global capacitance, where the bulk of the power supply capacitance is divided all over the board. The other way to do it is to put the bulk of the total capacitance at the power input and smaller ceramic tantalum or film capacitors close to the integrated circuits as decoupling capacitors. And here is an example of a ceramic decoupling capacitor on the board. Most of the electrolytic capacitors are rated for 50 volts and 10 microfarads as you can see. The total capacitance of them comes to around 200 microfarads or so, which could be achieved with a single capacitor. If I was the designer I would just replace these 10 microfarad capacitors with bigger ones near the power input and maybe add a few film capacitors parallel to the ceramic decoupling capacitors near the integrated circuits. By doing this we would make the device more reliable because aluminum electrolytic capacitors have a limited lifetime compared to other capacitor types. Luckily for this device most of the capacitors are rated at 50 volts and the more destructive failure mode, a short circuit, usually develops because of applied overvoltage. There are also milder failure modes like decreasing capacitance and an open circuit, but those would not make the device unoperational. The power supply on this device is single sided, meaning you only have a positive supply voltage and the ground. There is no negative voltage rail for any, any of the circuits. The supply voltage for the amplifier circuits is not regulated. There are only two diodes that make sure you don't damage the amplifier if you connect an opposed polarity DC supply on it. The 15 volts coming in is regulated to 5 volts and 3.3 volts for the digital circuits. All of the 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitors mentioned earlier filter the input voltage. Having a single sided supply means that the signal needs to be referenced to a DC voltage above the ground. Having a DC offset to the output of the amplifier would be terrible to your headphones and to any other devices, and so the DC has to be removed from the signal. This is done by having series capacitors on the outputs. 
and here we can find the DC blocking blue capacitors 470 microfarads 16 volts for the headphone output these series capacitors form a high pass filter with the load that's the headphones in this case and the minus 3 decibels corner frequency for this high pass filter for 30 ohm headphones it's around 11.2 hertz the output capacitors for the line outputs don't need to be such high capacitance uh, because the connected load is expected to be at least tens of kilo ohms that is the input impedance of the amplifiers inside your powered monitors for example this device uses a PCM1754 DAC chip which is quite old some of the application nodes date back to year 2000 the headphone output uses three OP amps in series NE5532 RC4558 and RC4580 it looks like one is used for gain one for filtering and the last one for buffering the output between the last operational amplifier and the headphone output we can see discrete transistors which are KTC2874 looking at their datasheet they are commonly used for muting circuits which seems to be the case in this amplifier too. The job of a muting circuit is to cut the output of the device in case the amplifier loses power or when the power is plugged back in. Muting circuits should be used especially if the device has output capacitors like this one since the capacitor will discharge through the headphones if they are connected and the power is lost on the device. On the smaller digital interface PCB we can find Tenor TE7022L USB to SPDIF chip that is USB 2.0 compatible and it supports 16 and 24 bit resolution and up to 96 kHz sampling rate. This board also has a PCM1808 analog to digital converter chip that is connected to the line inputs and the Tenor interface chip. The line inputs on this device work like this. You can select the line input to monitor them with headphones or speakers. And even if you don't select the line input, you can choose the device as an input device on your computer. So you can always record the line input signal without monitoring it. On the matter of grounding, I really like what they've done to connect the PCB ground to the amplifier case. Let's slide the main PCB off to see the two pair traces on both ends of the PCB connecting the ground to the metal case. In addition to this, there is a metal part on the bottom of the PCB that is connected to the metal case. Uh, the coating on the case has also been scratched off to make a better connection. The top part of the case is grounded through the screws holding the front and back lids on the case. The only thing I would have done differently is not to have the metal grounding slab in the middle of the PCB and rather have it as close to the power supply input connector as possible. And that is to avoid a common ground impedance between the circuits on the board and the case. What I don't like about the grounding on the board is that the digital and analog circuits share the same ground plane. This allows for galvanic noise coupling from digital to analog circuits because of a common ground impedance. Uh, what I would have done is to have a dedicated plane for both the analog and the digital circuits and connect those planes as close as you can get to the power supply connector and this would minimize the common ground impedance they share. I can make a more in-depth video about common ground impedance and the way noise may couple through if you guys want me to. And now let's move on to the measurement part of the video. This part is a small recap on the measurements I've taken on the device. You can find all of the measurements on audio science review forums and the link is in the description. This is a one volt RMS uh, output for the device when the input signal is also 1 volts RMS so it's unity gain 
and we can see that the third harmonic is the main dominating harmonic on this device. We can also see a spike at 100 Hz, which is two times the grid frequency here. And that um, spike originates from the DC power supply. Here are two frequency response charts. Uh, one is for 330 ohms and the second one is for 30 ohms load on the headphone output. You may wonder why the frequency response is so different numbers on the Y scale. Here the main weakness of the headphone output comes into play. The device has an output impedance of around 55 ohms measured with 1 kHz output signal. We can assume that the output impedance is around that for the whole 20 Hz to 20 kHz range. This means that with 30 ohm headphones you are losing over half of your signal inside the amplifier. The output level I set for these frequency response charts is 1 volts RMS. With this output level the 30 ohm headphones only get around 0.35 volts RMS. And the last featured measurement is the total harmonic distortion versus output voltage. Because of the high output impedance the 30 ohm load shows less harmonic distortion than the 300 ohm load and no loaded situations. This is because the amplifier output has higher amplitude leading to better signal to noise ratio while the voltage on the load is the same as on the other graphs. The total harmonic distortion performance on this device is not that great compared to offerings in today's market but looking at the manual it exceeds the specified performance of less than 0.05% with output levels higher than 0.05 volts RMS. And for the conclusion I would say that the device has not aged all that well. If the headphone output impedance was low, around 1 ohms, I would say that this device is ok for the price because of the features you get for the money. There are not that many DAC amplifier combos for around 120 euros. And this one has headphone output, volume controlled line outputs for active speakers and even an ADC that's not super horrible. However, because of the high output impedance, my verdict is a thumbs down for this product. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more Teardance Plus measurements on DAX and amplifiers in the future. And sorry for my Finnish accent, I hope you could understand most of what I was saying.